helping migrants in San Diego in the debate over using county resources. Plus, waiting at the border, the choice for migrants who want to apply for asylum. Also, fluttering away, why monarchs could be at risk in California. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. San Diego County is now looking at ways to temporarily house migrants seeking asylum. Supervisors voted to look at available properties. As KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman explains, not everyone was on board. Board of Supervisors Chair Diane Jacobs says she would rather see county resources directed toward veterans who are homeless. I believe our priority should be take care of our own first. In the last couple of months, Immigration and Customs Enforcement has been dropping off migrant families seeking asylum in San Diego without resources or travel plans. Supervisors Greg Cox and Nathan Fletcher say if the state and federal government won't help, the county needs to step up. We have an issue here that we have to deal with. And the reality is we have the capacity to help. Uh, we have the ability to help. And I agree we should take care of our own. And and in America, when you when you come here and you have legal status, I believe that makes you our own. Supervisor Kristen Gaspar says it's not the county's responsibility to house the migrants. It is the responsibility of our state to provide these shelters, and they are outright neglecting to do so. That's a large reason why we're here today. And while I appreciate the efforts of my colleagues to provide additional county alternatives in this area, it is not our role in the partnership and picking up for the slack of the state will ultimately take away precious resources from what is our primary responsibility at the county level. The county has been providing health screenings at a shelter set up by a group called the San Diego Rapid Response Network, which is made up of local nonprofits. Jewish Family Service is a member of the network and says they have sheltered more than 4,000 migrants, usually for a period of 24 to 48 hours, but they don't have a permanent space to do it. At the end of the day, we still need funding for the operation and we need a location. And so uh, this moves the needle in terms of helping uh, the county getting involved and helping to uh, see if there's a possible location. The board ultimately voted three to two to direct staff to identify county properties that could be used as a temporary migrant shelter. Jacob and Gaspar voted against the move with supervisors Cox, Fletcher, and Jim Desmond voting in favor. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. The fight continues over California's sanctuary state law. Immigrant rights advocates are pushing back on a legal challenge to the law. Huntington Beach has filed a lawsuit saying the law interfered with its authority to enforce local laws. The law limits police collaboration with federal ICE agents. A judge agreed. Now immigration rights advocates are responding by filing an appeal. Mexican officials plan to close the main Tijuana shelter for the Central American migrant caravan. KPBS border reporter Jean Guerrero says it's a move that could leave hundreds of people on the streets amid record violence in the city. Barreta's shelter was set up to house migrants from the caravan. Many want asylum in the U.S., but face weeks of waiting in Mexico before they can try to make their case to U.S. officials due to backlogs at the ports of entry. The number of migrants at Barretal has dwindled from about 3,000 at its apex to about 700 now. Shelter coordinator Leonardo Neri says there's different reasons for that. Muchos de ellos han optado por el regreso Many have decided to return voluntarily to their countries. Y otros más han Others have been crossing into the U.S. He says hundreds have applied for temporary Mexican work permits and are renting rooms across Tijuana. Neri says the government plans to close the shelters soon to encourage people to integrate into Mexican society. But that's going to affect migrants like Karen Perez, who's waiting her turn to ask for asylum in the U.S. legally. She came here with her four children fleeing death threats in Nicaragua. <laughs> She's on a weeks-long wait list for asylum. Paris says if she's evicted before she can get into the U.S., she's going to get a work permit in Mexico to try to feed and house her kids while she's waiting. If God gave me strength to come from Nicaragua, 
Why wouldn't I be able to work to survive? But some immigration attorneys say those temporary work visas in Mexico could hurt people's chances of getting asylum in the U.S. A judge could interpret the visas as firm resettlement in a safe third country, despite Mexico's record homicides. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. Takeout food containers will get a makeover in San Diego thanks to a new law. City council members made a styrofoam ban official today, and this covers several products from A cartons to food containers to beach toys. Council member Chris Ward says today's vote makes San Diego the largest city in California to ban styrofoam. Most of our styrofoam got trucked out of county, that adds emissions, and then it ended up in a landfill somewhere in Imperial or Riverside County. So what's the point? We know that there are product alternatives available that we can shift towards that are biodegradable. The ban goes into effect in 30 days. Restaurants with a gross annual income of less than $500,000 can apply for a two-year waiver from the ban. Governor Gavin Newsom will present his first budget tomorrow, and he promises it will include $40 million to make two-year community colleges free. KPBS education reporter Megan Burks says some local colleges had already planned on picking up the tab. If the budget and a companion bill authorizing free community college pass, local administrators say they'll shift their fundraising efforts to cover what the state plan won't, textbooks and possibly transportation. Students can't be successful if they're hungry. They can't be successful if they're living in their car. They can't be successful if they don't have their textbooks. Newsom's proposal would also free up local resources to support non-traditional students like veterans. The bill establishing the state's program would limit it to first-time, full-time students. The bill's author says there's broad support for the measure. We're the fifth largest economy now in the world. Uh, and in order for us to, to continue to grow our economy, to have a skilled workforce, um, you need an educated people. You have to give me a mathematical reason in number 13. About 100 years ago, uh, it was the case that we decided as a society that high school should be free uh, because high school was the, um, the entry point to the job market and to uh, the middle class and to success. Uh, and we're at a point now where actually community colleges have, have risen to that same level. So uh, I can't underscore enough the importance of supporting students uh, at this level of higher education. The bill and Newsom's budget must both pass the legislature. Megan Burks, KPBS News. California businesses may have to do away with paper receipts. AB 161, also called the Skip the Slip Bill, was introduced today. It would require all California businesses to use digital receipts by 2022, unless a customer specifically asks for a hard copy. One of the easiest ways we can ensure that the recycling, the recycling that we actually put into our recycling bin actually gets recycled is by making that waste stream much, much cleaner and purer. And one of the ways is to not pollute it with receipts that are not recyclable and again have chemicals that are toxic. From the, uh, environmental A report by Green America says paper receipts create 686 million pounds of waste every year. Committee hearings on the bill are expected in the spring. There's a new milestone for cancer in the U.S. The death rate has been falling for at least 25 years. A new report out today from the American Cancer Society shows lower smoking rates translates into fewer deaths. Experts also credit advances in early detection and treatment. The numbers do not reflect all types of cancers, however. The report shows obesity-related cancer deaths are rising and prostate cancer deaths are no longer dropping. Research from UC San Diego finds cannabis can be useful in treating chronic pain and weaning people off of opioids. As KPBS's Jade Hyman reported in April, there are challenges when it comes to advancing that research. When the Cedar Fire broke out and encircled Rudy Reyes's home, he doused himself with water and made an impossible decision. My house is now on fire, couldn't stay in there. So I come out and basically made the decision to run through the fire line. I covered my face with my hands, 
lost his finger that year because the fire was coming from that angle. Rudy ran through the flames and survived. The water combined with heat from the fire created steam so intense it peeled off 75% of his skin. His nerve so badly damaged his sense of touch immediately turned cold. He was found disoriented and in shock along the road hours later. Doctors had to put him in an induced coma for two months, and the next year of his life was spent in a hospital bed at UC San Diego Medical Center. During that time, I was having complications with the medications and the fact that some of these medications being opiate-based were overdosing me. I was slowly dying from having this in me so long. So doctors decided to try medical cannabis. As they slowly introduced it to his body, he says his blood pressure went down, his muscles relaxed, and there was no need for morphine. And then ask him if they just want to come pick it up. Dr. Mark Wallace is with UC San Diego's Center for Medical Cannabis Research. He's been studying cannabis and its use for chronic pain for nearly two decades. He says his studies reveal cannabis is a safer and more effective treatment for pain than opioids. It's this inverted U with the THC and pain. As the THC levels go up in the blood, pain will go down until the point where it actually starts going in the opposite direction. As the blood levels go up, pain will actually start worsening. And so there is this therapeutic window. A therapeutic window where just the right amount of cannabis treats pain and replaces opioids for about 70% of his patients. The bottom line is I, I prefer to visit medical cannabis before we resort to an opioid. I, I think cannabis is much more conservative. I think it's lower risk. There's never been a reported death from medical cannabis or cannabis. Look at all the deaths annually from opioid use. Reyes says while he survived the fire, research like this is keeping him alive. Cannabis has made living with burns bearable. 75% of my outside skin is now missing that nerve that tells me pain. So in order to have any sensation, anything like that, it's always itchy. It's always crawly. It's always, and I can itch to the point of bloody, it won't make any difference. I smoke a little marijuana or ingest a little marijuana because there's different ways to ingest it now, and that goes away. Do you know how many pills it used to take to do that? A plethora of pills to do with one little plant can do. So instead of swallowing pain pills, he smokes marijuana, consumes edibles. And this stuff is aloe vera based. And soothes his skin with cannabis creams while spending small amounts of time under the sun. This is my chocolate mint. In his garden. I've expanded and learned more to the point where I'm taking care of other herbs beyond it. Even though his studies reveal benefits to medical cannabis, Dr. Wallace says more research is necessary to pinpoint dosing. But the research has been almost impossible since marijuana is still a Schedule I controlled substance, right alongside drugs like heroin, LSD, and bath salts. The DEA has it listed as a drug with no medical use. The National Institute on Drug Abuse says 9% of people using marijuana become dependent. The organization also says several studies link its use to an increased risk for psychiatric disorders. But again, more studies are needed to actually know how. Because it's federally illegal, it makes, the, it's, it makes it extremely difficult to do research. And the reason is, is because since it's scheduled one, the only source for it is the, is the government, NIH. And that source of medical cannabis does not represent real world. So the push continues from both patients and researchers to make cannabis more accessible, especially to those living with chronic pain facing an opioid addiction. I'm in California and immediately UCSD gave me an option out. Not everybody got that. Not everybody got that like I did. I'm one of the blessed ones. Jade Hindman, KPBS News. There's a special type of transplant that's saving lives. Last spring, KPBS reporter Maya Trabolsi introduced us to patients who say its strict regulation could limit access. A fecal microbiota transplantation, or FMT, saved Robert Hyde's life. I have prayed that God would open up an avenue for me to talk about this. He battled a drug-resistant bacterial infection called C. diff for four years costing him thousands of dollars in medication costs. But the fecal transplant 
That was a different story. When I had the fecal transplant in the hospital, my bill was zero. But what if you've got something else that may respond to a fecal transplant? 16 years ago, I was diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease. Joel Spreckman runs an intestinal health community resource called One Great Gut in San Diego. Because he suffers from inflammatory bowel disease and not C. diff, he couldn't get the transplant he wanted in the United States due to FDA guidelines in place since 2013. I love my country. But if I can't get the treatment I need here, I have to go elsewhere. He went to Australia to get a series of 10 transplants. In this picture, he is doing a handstand to keep one of the treatments inside his body. I've probably never experienced such potent medicine so quickly. But the financial burden was too great to continue therapy. It was probably in excess of 13K. His condition worsened, at one point dropping in weight to 115 pounds. He even imagined suicide. I can wrap my hand around and my fingers touch. I've had many stool tests just to see what's going on, to check it out. And every time I hope that I have C. diff because then I can get, it can be paid for. I can get the fecal transplant that's very helpful. Dr. Michael Lagine at Sharp Grossmont Hospital says fecal matter is regulated as a drug in the name of um, safety. Yeah, you know, we don't wanna use something and figure out later that it has risks. So everything has to run and we have a very respected agency, which is the FDA. The FDA considers the use of FMT to be experimental and generally bans its use outside of approved trials but it does allow it in the case of C. diff infections if other treatments aren't working, in what they call enforcement discretion. And I get to say, yes, I can use this therapy to treat you. Thank you, FDA. Dr. Mark Davis is a naturopathic doctor who specializes in fecal transplantation. He believes its use needs to be broadened. It's a lot safer than any of the drugs and more effective. <laughs> That's the bottom line. Dr. Davis says before the FDA restrictions took effect, he used FMT for patients with several chronic intestinal conditions. What did you end up having for lunch? He was in San Diego for my interview on his way back from Baja, California, where he consulted at a retreat that offered medically supervised fecal transplants for people who couldn't get them here. The patient cost for the retreat? $15,000 for a two-week stay. The people who go to these retreats are people who feel like they don't have any other options. They're people who feel like they've tried everything in conventional medicine, and often people who feel like they've tried everything in alternative medicine. At his practice in Maryland, Dr. Davis says patients who can't afford retreats still plead with him for help in spite of FDA rules. I have had people try and bribe me um, or say, can we skirt the law somehow? But I, um, I don't love the law. But I, I follow it, so. But there is something he says he can legally do to help. You can do it at home. We can screen the donor. When they come up clear, you can collect their stool. You can process it and self-administer it. And it's not really harder than following most kitchen recipes at home. So it's like cooking. Uh, yeah, it's a lot like cooking. I understand the pain and suffering that patients go through. And um, the answer, though, is not in trying something that is not um, at least shown to be effective in their condition. Back at Sharp Grossmont Hospital, infectious disease specialist Dr. Fadi Haddad argues right now there just isn't enough evidence to support the use of FMT for conditions other than C. diff. We have to take our time and get the right studies, the right research, the right donors, the right bacteria, and, conclude, and make the right conclusions. But it could be years before FMT is approved for other conditions. Joel Spreckman says he and others like him feel they are running low on options. People are going to do it at home, unsupervised, highly risky, putting themselves and their family at risk, all because of these, these silly rules and regulations. Feces is a stinky, messy, magical mass of microbes. People who have been sick who say, you know, the minuscule chance of an, of an adverse event happening from FMT is absolutely worth it to me in order to get the potential benefit from this therapy. For Robert and Nadine Hyde, the evidence is clear. As both friend and foe, bacteria has the power to take away Safe again. or give life. Maya Trabulsi, KPBS News. <laughs> Wonderful.
Good evening. I hope you had a nice day. The weather is not bad, but we will see a couple of showers creeping into the forecast throughout this week. Taking a look at what's going on right now. Well, not much. The precipitation is staying far to the north of us. That's because there's a big ridge here in the southwest and it's gliding that uh, rain all the way up to northern California, eventually to Washington state. But that does not mean we're in the clear. We could see a couple of showers Thursday morning and then again over the weekend. So for tonight, 54 degrees for the the temperature partly cloudy skies tonight and in Oceanside will reach 44 degrees for that low Ramona at 38. So pretty chilly conditions there. Chula Vista at 49 and Mount Laguna coming in at 37 degrees. Wednesday there's going to be rain spreading to the south. Now it's not really going to reach us, but we do expect to see a little bit of precipitation. Just a couple of light showers early on Thursday morning and then sunshine throughout the day for tomorrow, though we're still sunny all day. 64 degrees in Oceanside. San Diego 65 and Chula Vista coming in right at 66 degrees in Borrego Springs. Expect to see plenty of sunshine 72 for that temperature. Here's late week and you can see uh, that big ridge is still in place here on the West Coast, so it's going to be pretty mild for a whole lot of people. So Thursday will be a dry day again. Could see some showers in the morning Friday a bit cloudy as a second system approaches San Diego. We'll see a shower or two Saturday, maybe a lingering one Sunday morning. Our temperatures will stay in those mid to low 60s. Inland, we'll see sunshine through Friday, and then we could see a shower popping up Saturday into Sunday, and our temperatures will decrease from those mid and upper 60s to those low 60s for our highs. In the mountains, you'll see those showers around Saturday and cloudier conditions on Sunday. Look at the high temperature on Sunday. Yikes, it gets cold down to 39 for the high. The low will be at 31 degrees. So with this front moving through, temperatures will be dropping, especially in those interior areas. And that's the case for the deserts. We're sunny through Friday in the 70s and then a couple showers for the weekend with temperatures dropping down to 59 for the high on Sunday. For KPPS News, I'm Erin Calandra. Back to you. Western monarch butterflies are disappearing from the coast of California. Researchers say their numbers are disturbingly low. KPBS host Deb Welsh has more details. A recent count by the Xerxes Society recorded fewer than 30,000 butterflies. The organization says that's an 86 percent decline since 2017. According to the San Francisco Chronicle, the group in 1981 counted more than one million western monarchs wintering in California. A 2017 study by Washington State University researchers found the species likely will go extinct in the next few decades if nothing is done to save them. Scientists say the butterfly is threatened by pesticides, herbicides, and destruction along their migratory route of milkweed habitat. They also have noted impacts from climate change. Typically, western monarch butterflies are seen from November to March along the California coast. Deb Welsh, KPBS News. All in the Family and the Jeffersons are just some of the titles he produced. Sitcom legend Norman Lear spoke with PBS NewsHour about the joyful stress of his career in TV. Mr. Lear, how do people treat you as you get older? Uh, yes, people, uh, as I grow older, people uh, consider me uh, uh, wiser. And uh, that too is I was a kid of the Depression. My dad, his brothers, they all went belly up. Everybody was broke. The great aunts and grandparents always had an expression that when somebody was making a buck, he was a good provider. A good provider. That was a sound I heard a lot. And uh, all I ever wanted to be was uh, a good provider. Oh, I had seen Carol O'Connor in a Blake Edwards comedy called What Did You Do in the War, Daddy? And I never forgot his face. He walked in and read, I don't think he finished the page before I knew that was, uh, that was Archie Bunker. I wrote those lines. He gave it his soul. The thing I love about Archie and Edith is they both talked a lot of they didn't really know 
uh, what they were talking about, but they had strong points of view. That's what most of America is about. I love doing plays, because they are plays, in front of a live audience. There develops a chemistry between the individual players and the audience. How does she communicate to people? You see, Robin thinks words are a waste of time, so she speaks with her eyes. Oh. <laughs> well, open up wide and let's hear the Gettysburg address. <laughs> On the air at one time, there was All in the Family and Maud, the Jeffersons, Good Times, One Day at a Time, The Facts of Life, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, Fernwood Tonight. People used to ask when all that was going on, you know, like you're under a lot of stress. There is stress and there's joyful stress. The stress I was under was altogether joyful. It ended with 240 live people sitting in an audience laughing. Go beat that. It all added time to my life. Hi, I'm Norman Lear, and this is my brief but spectacular take on uh, all the things that made me wind up with the life I've led. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.